Well, I can tell you this introduction I am about to make uh, is, is one that is unnerving for a physician. The legal depth in this room uh, at the present time is so great that I, I'm somewhat quaking uh, in my boots as a, as a doctor. I think the man I'm about to, interest to introduce to you, had he chosen to become a physician instead of a lawyer, I would be introducing you a Nobel Prize winner in medicine at the present time. And I am indeed most pleased uh, to introduce to you today's speaker, Judge Abner J. Mikva. Judge Mikva is the 17th and present occupant of the University of Oregon's Wayne Morris Chair of Law and Politics. There must be few people anywhere with the simultaneous expert credentials in both law and politics that are Judge Mikva's. After graduating from the University of Chicago Law School with honors and the editorship of the Law Review under his belt, and the friendship of our, one of our past presidents, Sid uh, Lezak, as well, uh, Abner Mikva became law crook to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sherman Minton. He returned to Illinois and became a partner in the law practice of the late Justice Arthur Goldberg. In 1956, he was elected to the first of five consecutive terms in the Illinois House of Representatives where he helped enact new criminal and mental health codes. Following his Illinois legislative experience, Judge Mikva was elected to five terms in the United States House of Representatives where he served in, on both the Ways and Means Committee and on the Judiciary Committees. In 1979, Abner Vickna started service on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and became Chief Judge in 1991. From 1994 until 1995, he was White House Counsel. Judge Mikva has taught courses in legislative process and legal ethics at several universities. At the present time, he is a visiting professor and the Walter V. Schaefer Fellow in Public Policy at the University of Chicago Law School. He has authored a textbook entitled The American Congress, The First Branch, and a law textbook entitled Legislative Process. Judge Mikva's wife recently retired from a position as Director of Development for a Washington think tank. The Mikvas have three daughters, two lawyers, and a rabbi. They also have seven grandchildren. Can there be anyone within earshot who has any doubt at all that Judge Abner Mikva is uniquely qualified to speak to us today about the initiative and referendum process in, on, in Oregon? What an honor to be allowed to introduce to you Judge Abner Mikva. Thank you very much, Dr. Storrs, for that very generous introduction. Had I become a physician, I would have pleased my wife inordinately. She is the non-lawyer in a family of five lawyers, and she wants to know how she got so lucky as to get five of them all to herself. <laughs> I appreciate the, very much that generous introduction, and I particularly appreciate the opportunity to, to share some thoughts with this distinguished organization. I've always felt a great kinship with Wayne Morse. Um, in this visit to Oregon, and the honor of sitting in the chair endowed in his name has made me more aware of why I felt and feel this way. First of all, as you heard, uh, I have three daughters. So did Wayne Morse. And there's nothing that can give a person a greater mix of hubris and humility than trying to pretend you are raising three daughters. Secondly, we both served in Congress, albeit not quite overlapping, and albeit that I was only a commoner and Wayne Morris was a member of the House of Lords for 24 years. <laughs> in reading Mason Druckmann's biography, I also found out that we shared an interest in the judiciary, which I had not known about before. Uh, Wayne Morris's interest in the judiciary was short-lived. Um, he abandoned that interest when he wasn't appointed in 1943, as he thought he should be and ran for the Senate instead. Uh, my interest carried me through 15 years of being a judge. But mostly Senator Morris and I shared the common values of growing up in Wisconsin, 
attending that great university and being affected by whatever it was that Senator La Follette and his followers put in the Wisconsin water supply. Now, Wayne had the good sense to emigrate to this great state of Oregon where he and his ideas were warmly accepted by, for most of his productive career. I'm sure they weren't accepted by everybody in Oregon, as I remember that's what happened to him in 1968. But they were accepted by enough people to have gotten elected four times before them. And to remain a model of what a good Oregon politician looks like. I went to Illinois, to Chicago no less, where my elections always were in doubt, except when I lost, and where I'm still perceived as some kind of a goo-goo, uh, that's good government, coming out of Wisconsin, advancing notions of government that just don't seem to fit the Chicago model. Uh, Sid Lezak uh, reminded me last night of a story that I love to tell. When I first came to Chicago, it was 1948, I had been told by my friends in Wisconsin that I should forget any nascent political ambitions I had, that Chicago was a closed operation, closed town. Whereas in Wisconsin, if you walked by the party headquarters slowly enough some night, you could be chairman before the night was over. But <laughs> I should forget about, about all that in Chicago. This was not, not what I should uh, expect. And I was prepared to accept that advice, except it was 1948. And Paul Douglas was running for senator, and Adlai Stevenson was running for governor. Now, I didn't know that the party bosses had decided that 48 was a losing year, and therefore they might as well put up somebody good. I thought it was for real, and one night on the way home from law school, I stopped by, and the, it said on the storefront window, 8th Ward, regular Democratic headquarters, Timothy O'Sullivan committeeman. And I stopped in and said, uh, I'm Abner Mikva. I'd like to volunteer to work for Stevenson and Douglas. And the quintessential Chicago ward committeeman took the cigar out of his mouth and peered at me and said, who sent you? <laughs> and I said, nobody sent me. He put the cigar firmly in his mouth and he said, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. And <laughs> and that was the beginning of my political career in Chicago. <laughs> It's that Wisconsin connection that I really want to talk about. When I was growing up, the concepts of initiative and referenda and recall were considered progressive traditions. Wisconsin doesn't have the initiative. Most states still do, and states like Oregon and California are using it to the max. Now, I have to say that over the years that I've spent in, in the legislative arena and on the courts and in the executive branch, I've found some corrosion in that Wisconsin progressive water supply. Some of the ideas that appealed to me when I was growing up and in college, uh, before I saw the political animal close up, just aren't that appealing anymore. And some of the ideas that I once thought were essential to a democracy turn out not to be essential and maybe even counter to democratic goals. For example, the election of all kinds of state officials, superintendents of public instruction and state treasurers and judges, especially judges, frustrate the expectations we have of the electoral process. Do we really want our education system to be managed by somebody who responds to political pressures and impulses? Is there a democratic way and a republican way of keeping the books of a state? Do we get an independent judiciary applying the law without political fear or favor by electing judges? Even in Oregon, despite your long history of an independent judiciary, one of my distinguished friends had to defend his judicial tenure on the Oregon Supreme Court against the charge that he was wrapping himself in the Constitution. Uh, some of you may remember that campaign when Hans Lindy uh, was successful, but uh, not, not without some angst among those of us who knew him and hoped he would prevail. The fact of the matter is that judges are expected to to play a counter-majoritarian uh, role in our society. We don't want them making popular decisions. We want them making just decisions and right decisions. And sometimes just and right decisions are very unpopular. Criminal cases are but one example. Uh, one of the reasons that I favor the lifetime appointment system of the federal judiciary is that most of the time, except for the occasional hot-button cases, what federal lifetime judges do 
uh, is not of consequence to most people. They can rest easy that only law students and their professors and a few interested lawyers will read and critique what they have written and done. I love to tell the story about my eldest daughter, who was practicing criminal law for a little while in Chicago. And about that time, the sentencing guidelines were, being, were coming down from the Sentencing Commission. And I was asked by my court to go testify before the Sentencing Commission about these proposed new guidelines. And I thought, well, you know, Mary's in federal court every day. She's doing allocutions, uh, uh, dealing with sentencing in the federal process. I'd, I'd uh, send her a copy of the guidelines and get her input. So I sent her a copy, and I said with a note, Mary, give me a call. I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, weeks went by, and I didn't hear from her. Those of you that have young offspring know that the communications process is not always as good as it might be given all the modern devices we have. And so I went to testify without the benefit of her help. About two weeks after I testified, I got a call from my beloved eldest daughter. And she said, Dad, I just went to a, a seminar on these new sentencing guidelines. They are outrageous. They are terrible. They're going to destroy the whole judicial system. How in the world could you let it happen? I mean, she stopped for breath. I said, you know, Mary, this is all very interesting. It would have been a lot more helpful if you had called me when I asked you to and give me this uh, Counsel. She said, when did you ask me to? I said, I sent you a note. With, she said, I bet you put it in one of those yellow franked envelopes. Well, I thought she was on me about using the franc. And I said, well, it was official business. I was entitled to use the franc. She said, no, no, no. I just assumed they were some more of your opinions. And I... <laughs> So much for judges thinking anybody really reads their opinions. <laughs> but you know, even in the hot button cases, unfortunately, few ever stop to read the opinions of the judges, even as they are criticizing the decisions reflected by those opinions. As an example, let's take a look at the recent California initiative on affirmative action, Prop 209. Uh, this initiative was approved by a substantial majority of California citizens. Chief Judge Thelton Henderson of the United States District Court for Northern California declared that it violated the federal constitution and struck it down. Now, I'm not here to either defend or attack his decision, especially since the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit swiftly overturned his decision. But what dismays me is that Judge Henderson was roundly attacked ad hominem by all kinds of people, pundits and politicians and even some judges, very few of whom, I dare say, stopped to read his opinion. Because had they read his opinion, had they so stopped, they would have read that Chief Judge Henderson was painfully aware of the awesome problem he had in putting his judicial responsibilities and beliefs in front of the popular beliefs of a majority of the Californians who voted for Proposition 209. This wasn't some loose gun judge running into the fray. He had thought about it. He uh, weighed it carefully, but he believed, and here I emphatically agree with him, that his first responsibility was to live up to his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and that that required him to strike down any provision of law, whether by the legislature, by the people of a state, or even by the Congress, which was in conflict with that Constitution. Now, Oregon has had its share of statewide initiatives that have spread themselves across the national stage, perhaps not quite as dramatically as uh, Prop 209. I was at the White House when your neighbor to the east approved the initiative on gay rights. I was saddened by the amount of judicial capital that was used up by both the Colorado Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court in striking down that, what I think was a pernicious proposition. Oregon has had a similar initiative, but the citizens of Oregon had the good sense to defeat it in the election. What troubles me, though, is that even in the Oregon case, or cases, and the Colorado case, and the California cases, we are asking judges to use the high bench and the black robes and the traditions of respect that they sometimes enjoy, and sometimes their immunity from political revenge, but not always, to interpose themselves and prevent an initiative from being voted on or striking it down after it's been approved. And I just think we are asking too much of the judiciary. As my constitutional law professor used to say in the first place, Sid, you may remember this, when you rely on judges to protect your liberty, you're relying on a very thin reed. Just recently, a divided panel of the 
U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit struck down a California initiative, Proposition 140, which amended the, const the California Constitution to impose lifetime limits on the terms that anyone could serve in the California legislature. The majority opinion by Judge Stephen Reinhardt, a very distinguished judge, very specifically recognized, and here I'm quoting from his opinion, the intractable conflict between principles at the heart of our representative government, the right of the people to choose whom they please to govern them, and the authority of a state to determine the structure of its political system. Now, I can freely predict that Judge Reinhardt's decision will send shockwaves uh, throughout all of the states that have adopted or are considering adopting term limits, because like the initiative itself, term limits are sold as some kind of panacea to voters who are suspicious and weary of the same old group of politicians who claim to represent them. Now, I'm not here to argue against term limits. I am aware that Oregon has adopted them. I happen to think that they are a foolish way of solving what is really, in this case, a fairly simple problem. If you don't like somebody, throw them out of office. Don't change the whole structure to get rid of, a, of some, some few that you don't like. But I'm here to express my concern at the new wave of judge bashing that's going to go on as a result of Judge Reinhardt's decision. Here he has, he has put himself in front of that freight train, uh, the overwhelmingly popular opinion, both in California and elsewhere, that term limits are a good thing to have. It's a good way of protecting the people against those rapacious politicians. There are some state legislatures that have voted for term limits on their own. But at least there, when it is done by the legislature, um, the proposition is more carefully considered, I think, than when it's on by an initiative. And it's, as I said, when it's done on an initiative, you're asking the people to vote in general, not even about their own representative, but in general, on the proposition of whether they should limit how long those bums can continue to rep misrepresent them. Well, that's an easy answer. Like most quick and easy answers to hard problems, term limits solutions, I think, are wide of the mark. But whether I'm right or not, the I think the citizens are just waiving too fundamental a right to have it be portrayed in the simplistic fashion that it is on an initiative that is binding on the, uh, either as an amendment to the Constitution or on the legislature. Well, I could talk to you about the referendum and recall as well. As far as I'm concerned, they too shimmer better in the rhetoric than in the reality. In Illinois, in the last election, the voters of, of a village were asked to vote yes or no on whether, and here I'm quoting, the village of Berkeley, Cook County, Illinois, shall become a home rule unit pursuant to Article 7, Section 6A of the Constitution of the State of Illinois. Close quote. No further explanation was given except by way of electioneering. Under Illinois law, you can't put anything else except the words of the proposition on the ballot. The issue carried, uh, and I would suspect that most voters of Berkeley still don't know whether they did well or poorly by becoming a home rule unit in Illinois. It's actually a very complicated subject under the Illinois uh, system because they give up certain, they get certain taxing benefits and they give up certain benefits that they get from the state otherwise. Um, some referenda, aside from that uh, confusing wording that I just described, some referenda issues are created with snappy titles, um, as our initiative issues, like the question of whether the state should provide more money for the schools without raising taxes. <laughs> now, who could be against that? Uh, the question really was whether or not to affirm a legislative decision to allow casino gambling in Illinois. And then there are the recall elections. Almost all of them are used to recall state legislators in the Midwest who have voted for tax increases. Never mind that the legislator was a thoughtful public official who rightly or wrongly thought the tax increase was necessary. Never mind that most state legislators are elected for two years, and if you're really mad, you can throw them out at the next regular election. Vote in the heat of your passions. Do it by recall. What better way to teach the legislature never to vote for a tax increase, no matter how, much, how necessary it is? I think we have to face up to the, where the ultimate responsibility for our democracy must rest, and that's on a legislative branch. You know, our founders were somewhat edgy about the executive branch. They didn't know how well this idea of an elected king was going to work. They weren't really comfortable with judges. A lot of them had suffered under the English judges and their various writs. But they knew full well what they were doing when they set up 
the legislative branch in the Constitution of the United States, and which most states have followed in their own state constitutions, they had all served in their colonial legislatures, and they understood that, that in the long run, it is the best way to achieve the deliberation and the thought necessary to decide where a particular population, a particular citizenry ought to be going. Now, is it frustrating? Sure it is. Does it work as quickly as it ought to? Of course not. And we built in these, these deliberate checks and balances, these, these, uh, um, these uh, in, in this, in additional functions uh, to, uh, that are almost uh, uh, redundant on each other in order to protect the process from going too fast. Bicameralism is a perfect example of that. If you know how frustrating it is to get a majority of your colleagues to agree on the exact set of words with every comma and every semicolon in exactly the same place, and then take that product over to the other body, who are always full of prima donnas, and get them to agree to the same set of words with all the semicolons and all the the commas in the same place, and then to get the super prima donna of them all, either the president or the governor, to agree to sign that piece of legislation, it's very hard to do. The first year I was in the legislature, I introduced more bills than any freshman legislator had ever put in before. Fortunately, none of them passed. Uh, <laughs> and I learned uh, the hard way that, that it, it's good that we can't move things that quickly, because sometimes it's a way of slowing down the process to see that we don't legislate too quickly on something that's more complicated than it would appear. I hope I don't have to persuade Argonians of how complicated that process could be. You're going to be asked to try to figure out whether you are uncomplicating or further complicating what to me is a very difficult question of assisted suicide comes this November. And I have to say that I, I have some views there. They're very conflicted about what the law ought to be about assisted suicide, but I'm sure that it is not something that in the first instance ought to be done in an initiative, up or down, yes or no. It's just not the way the process ought to work. And is it painful? Sure. As I said, bicameralism, the exact words, the signing. I remember carrying a bill for, for our governor in Illinois when I was in the legislature, and I'd gotten it through the House and the Senate just dumped on it uh, unceremoniously. And I saw the governor that night at a cocktail party, and I said, Governor, I still told him what had happened. I said, Governor, it's enough to make a unicameralist out of me. He looked at me coldly, and he said, well, that would solve half the problem. <laughs> <laughs> if I were back in the legislature today, I would start a vigorous campaign to get rid of these notions that the initiative, the referenda, and the recall benefit our democracy. I would try to eliminate them altogether or make them as hard to use as possible. And I recognize that it would be a very uphill battle, uh, even in a thoughtful state like Oregon. But to ask the courts to do the political heavy lifting is too costly to our other needs for the judicial process, and it won't happen. To stand pat is equally unacceptable. To continue to try to defend representative government one issue at a time it's just not very likely that you're going to defeat the next initiative entitled Property Taxes Reduction Act, which I think you just approved uh, in 1996, your recent measure 47, uh, and as a part of your constitution, no less. We're asking voters to improve, to approve some important legal propositions in a way that no responsible legislator would act in the first instance. I would never vote for a proposition that could not be amended, about which I had heard only special interest debate with wording that I could not get explained except from special pleaders, and which was put before me through paid solicitors who, in effect, took over every piece of the legislative process except the yeas and nays at the end of the process. And to ask citizens who have to work for a living, who at other tasks than being legislators, who would much rather watch the ducks than a debate on gay rights, who have children to raise and gardens to tend and prejudices to keep, to approve or disapprove that proposition is as foolish as it sounds. Now, I don't know how long it would take to get the voters of Oregon to agree to elect legislators who would vote to end or restrict the initiative process in Oregon, and to get voters who would then agree to approve whatever constitutional changes might be necessary to achieve that goal. It
probably wouldn't take as long as in Illinois. Um, fortunately for us, uh, the initiatives are only advisory and they aren't used too often. We do have referenda for bond issues, and in many of the local jurisdictions, we contrive to evade the purposes of the referenda. We have our election, our referenda elections on Saturday morning to make sure that only the parents come out and the rest of the people stay home. Is that really the way to make policy in a free society? I don't think so. Um, I do think that the recommendations of the City Club of Portland to clean up the Oregon mess are substantial steps in the right direction, and I commend all of you for what I think is an outstanding report. But I have to say that, with, first, with all due deference to my longtime friend, Justice Hans Lindy, the notion that the state courts can protect the legislative process from being undermined by the initiative process by somehow making it more difficult and putting roadblocks in the way is placing an undue burden on the judicial process, as I said, and, I won't, and it won't succeed. And finally, I have to say, with all, with the greatest of deference, that I wish the City Club had not sought to be quite as consensual as it was in its conclusions when it said that the initiative has been, is, and should continue to be an important alternative in the legislative process. Or to put it in the more subtle words of Senator Wayne Morse, who was describing one of his Oregon colleagues, he said, you have been evasive, equivocal, and all things to all people, end of quote. Now, I have to say that I think the initiative and the referendum and the recall have been, are, and will continue to be very bad ways to do anything of any importance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As, as you know, Oregon has been a pioneering state in the initiative, referendum, and recall, and I think you addressed those very well. Um, at the same time, the democratic process has become more complicated. Um, there's been more efforts to make it accessible, and, and I'd like your opinions on one other thing that Oregon has been a pioneer in, and that's the uh, issue of vote by mail. Well, I like vote by mail, but I have to admit that I don't like the idea of being able to muck up your state constitution sitting in the comfort of your living room and voting yes or no on some initiatives that change the Oregon constitution. I guess that's the most mischievous part of the whole initiative process is this idea that you can actually change your constitution in the first instance by an initiative that has never uh, passed any kind of muster except that the voters are asked to vote for some attractive proposition. I do like the idea of voting by mail. It appeals to me as, uh, again, we ought to make access to the process as simple as possible. I don't think that the complicated registration and voting in this uh, uh, ballot box are necessary to, to people expressing themselves about who they want to represent them. But I would hope that the same thought process that encouraged Oregonians to to realize that, that this makes it easier to, to vote on who you want to represent you would remind you that the idea is a representative process. This isn't some big town meeting where everybody in the state gets together and has the same information before them and can exchange views and then come up with a thoughtful decision. The, the idea is to get representatives, put them in on a short leash, two years, uh, Thomas Jefferson wasn't at the convention, but he favored even one-year terms for Congress and put them on as short a leash as you want to, um, as far as regular elections are concerned, but then let them make the decisions and then throw the bums out. And as I say, the more accessible you can make that process, the better I like it. Incidentally, I, I don't really think that you were uh, quite as pussyfooting as that phrase sounded. It's just that it was one of Wayne Morris's precious quotations that I had to fit into the speech somehow. And <laughs> that seemed to be the only place to do it. He did say that about one of his colleagues. <laughs> yes. Uh, you evoke Wayne Morris and Thomas Jefferson, but Morris was not exactly one who genuflected to elites. And it was Jefferson who said that the problems with democracy are solved by more democracy. Uh, <clears throat> there is a countervailing view to yours which holds that we are losing our human rights and democratic rights. We see GATT now displacing the nation states with uh, international corporate courts. We see the financing of our national government uh, 
being done by uh, uh, large corporate interests. We see harmonization politics where the Republicans and Democrats find increasingly little to disagree with and everything is treated as a technical problem. Say that last phrase again. I want to know what newspapers you're reading. The Democrats and Republicans are finding less to disagree about? Yes. In the Congress of the United States? Yes. You must have some stories in the Argonian we that have, we don't get in Chicago. Well, <laughs> we, have on, we have on issue after issue, we have, we have a, a Democratic president leaning on the, uh, on the Democrats to make uh, the deal, to, to ratify the deal that he's making with the Republicans. And we see harmonization as the order of the day rather than, uh, than the divisive appeals, which are the heart of, of Democratic action. And uh, question. the question is, the question is, do I agree? But go ahead. No, I'll let the, you finish. The, the sure. question is, the question is, given uh, the the arguments on the other side and the point of view on the other side, which is which is, uh, you know, broad based and consistent. Don't you think it would be appropriate if this body would have someone speak just once who is in support of the initiative process? Well, I think you just did, but. Uh... <laughs> I realize you didn't have as much time as I did and you didn't get the advanced billing I did. Let me just disagree, obviously I, we don't agree, but let me just disagree with one of your premises and see if I can uh, put it on a factual basis so that we don't have to persuade each other uh, of what I think is a fairly fundamental position from what I've read about you. Let me, um, let me talk to you about a vote that occurred yesterday in the House of Representatives, which was decided I may be wrong on the absolute numbers, but it was specifically a one-vote margin. It was 202 to 201, I think, with the Speaker Gingrich breaking the tie and using a lot of arm-twisting uh, and calling in his chits as Speaker to get the 202 votes to do it. Now, it was on a matter that you could look at first blush as something of very local importance. It was whether or not vouchers should be used in the D.C. schools. But this is a very complicated difficult issue that congressmen and legislators and governors and citizens are wrestling with all over the country. And we're going to have to come to terms with that problem one way or the other. We're going to have to decide, no, we don't want it. Yes, we do want it. Or these are the limitations on it. But at least they're arguing about it. And it was not both parties harmonizing each other. I haven't seen any important issues that get harmonized in the Congress, not even not even by a very successful, popular president. And uh, this president isn't always successful. He is somewhat popular. So I disagree on the basic premise. I don't think that's happening. As far as you're talking about international agreements and international tribunals, my friend, we are so much smaller than the world perceived, than we perceived the world to be when I was growing up in Wisconsin, when we really thought we could do something like a town meeting. And if not a town meeting about the national affairs, and certainly we could confine our decisions about what was going on abroad by just pulling the oceans over our head and saying, to hell with the rest of the world. Well, it doesn't work that way. And there are going to have to be international tribunals to resolve some of these problems. I find that very painful. I'm a student of American law. I love our processes. I love our Constitution. The notion of giving away some of the decisional process to some foreign court sitting in Strasbourg or some foreign court sitting in Rio de Janeiro is troubling. But what are we going to do about the fact that this world is so tiny and that what happens on, in, the, in Bonn or what happens in London and what happens in, in, uh, uh, in Beijing is going to affect my children and my grandchildren and yours? And I'd rather we be a part of the decisional process than pretend that we can ignore the decisions altogether. So with all deference, I think that representative government is here to stay. I think it's going to have to stay. It's going to have to work better than it does. But the notion that we can somehow abandon it and pretend we're all just one big town meeting with, full of good, well-meaning citizens who are going to come to the right decision just because we mean well, I disagree. Charlie Hinkle, I'm a member of the club. I guess Mr. Kafori is too. Uh, he and I are on opposite sides of a lot of issues surrounding uh, the initiative, and I want to commend you for your remarks today, Judge, and to share with you uh, my uh, disappointment at the timidity of the City Club in not uh, making bolder steps in, uh, or recommending bolder steps to reform the initiative. 
I testified to that committee and urged them to uh, urge the uh, abolition of the uh, uh, initiative, but they uh, chose not to go that far. Uh, I think it would be very difficult to argue that the states of this union that do not have the initiative are, uh, have any inferior prison systems or inferior road systems or inferior school systems or inferior public policies in any way uh, inferior to those of the states that labor with the initiative. My question to you, uh, Judge, has to do with, again, the judiciary, I suppose, you know, the problems of the guarantee clause. And I wonder if you could comment about the Republican form of government guarantee, and you know, I'm sure, the impediment we face with the U.S. Supreme Court decision of almost 100 years ago now saying it's not a justiciable controversy or, or it's something the federal courts can't rule on. Do you see any prospect that the federal courts might be willing to rethink that under the... We have a, we have a new Supreme Court that is rethinking so many constitutional doctrines. I wonder if there's hope for us in this one. Well. I hate to dash water on, on hopes of someone with whom I seem to agree so much on basic premises, but on this one, I frankly hope that the Supreme Court doesn't take it, because if they do, and they do decide it's a justiciable question and are willing to abandon the political question doctrine, which could well happen because uh, they've abandoned it in other areas, I, I'm painfully, uh, um, I believe with uh, all due deference that there are at least six votes up there, at least six votes that would say representative government is not impeded or implicated by issues such as referenda or initiatives or recall. I, I think that's wrong. I think that a study of constitutional history should come out the other way. But my guess is that if they agreed that they had jurisdiction, they'd decide it wrong anyway in my view and in your view, and therefore better they should stay out of it. Besides which, that really isn't how we're going to get reform of the problem. I think that reform of the problem is that more painful persuasion of the voters. Uh, judges just aren't going to do it for us, even, even courageous judges. I mean, I look at Judge Reinhardt's decision. I said to one of the people I was at dinner last night, they asked me about it. I said, you better read it quick. It won't be around very long. I don't think it's going to last. Yes. <laughs> Judge, I, I certainly appreciate your comments, and of course, with respect to your admonition, Jack, it is, oh, yourself. Jack Beatty, city club member, it is a part of the democratic process to achieve sufficient consensus in order to arrive at a conclusion, whether it's in a club or in the legislative process. Uh, and that we would plead in defense of our position. I, I uh, not only ex understand it, I accept it, and uh, where, I, you, where, where you are, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> With respect to your general observations about the impact of the initiative process, uh, do you have any comment on the impact that that uh, may have had in juris other jurisdictions that have the initiative, the impact of the initiative on the working of the legislature itself? Well, I think it diminishes that, that work. I think that I just try to put myself in a legislature where, in a state which had an active initiative such as they do in Oregon and in California and Washington, I just think that it makes the role of the legislature less important. It makes the responsibility of the legislators smaller. Uh, the buck doesn't stop there. It stops with the people. And, and uh, the more you you impinge on the notion of representative government, the less those elected officials are going to act like representatives. Uh, so I think that it compounds the problem. I really do. And I think that states that have initiatives and uh, actively use them are, um, end up with legislatures that, that look like uh, uh, the problem that created the initiatives in the first place. And that is that the legislatures don't do very much and don't do it very well. And uh, people don't have a high regard for them. And they don't have a high regard for themselves which sounds kind of hopeless, except that I guess I'm a kind of a believer in, in the long run that we do make progress from crisis to crisis in this country. This great constitution that still governs the, the states um, came out of a crisis. We were about to go under fiscally because of the inadequacy of the Articles of Confederation, and they got together first in Annapolis and then in Philadelphia and came up with this marvelous document. Uh, but it was from a crisis, and I just have a feeling that perhaps, and it's easier for me to say from afar than it must be living here, that 
if Oregonians and Californians and Washingtonians keep putting one initiative after another on their ballots and through their ballots, which like in California where frequently they will vote, they will approve two initiatives that are diametrically opposite each other, or in Oregon where you will put hot button questions like assisted suicide on two years in a row, that at a certain point the people of the state are going to say, enough of this nonsense, let's, let's go back to the really fixing the representative government and making it work better. That's very hard to do, and it may take longer than, than I'd like to think it will, but I think it'll happen. Yes? B.J. Seymour, City Club member, and uh, the first non-lawyer to ask a question this afternoon. <laughs> Aren't there some issues that are politically uh, so such hot buttons that only the initiative can take them up. Aren't there issues where the majority of citizens think one way, but there are strong uh, political forces, heavy election contributors that think the other way, that make it hazardous for a legislator to vote for a certain position? There are such issues. But I think until you get enough of a consensus in the body politic to elect a group of representatives and can come to a reasonable accommodation of these varying points of views, you shouldn't act. And again, I cite assisted suicide as a perfect example. The proposition that I must say I read closely for the first time when I was preparing this, and, and I'm, I'm still somewhat confused about why some limitations were in there and why some others weren't and so on, but the proposition that Oregonians supported, uh, what, two years ago or four years ago, uh, certainly didn't reflect the overwhelming, enthusiastic, unanimous opinion of people who lived in Oregon. As I recall, the vote was, what, 51-49 or something like that, or very close. And now it's being jousted about again. And I hope that this jousting will shed some light, but I doubt it. And I hope it'll bring people together, but that isn't the tenor of the letters to the editor I've been reading or the editorials I've been reading, that this is a great unifying uh, 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 initiative that's on the ballot. It, so I guess the answer is that, that on a troublesome question like death with dignity, assisted suicide, whatever title you want to put on it, we're going to have to struggle within our citizenry until we find some accommodation of our views. And until then, there shouldn't be any law, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's painful, but that, I think that's where I have to come down. Yes. Arnold Kogan, member of the City Club. Judge, we're all aware, painfully aware, that uh, voters are, these days are so distrustful of politicians. We have that kind of climate these days. Uh, I'd like to hear your views of why, why would politicians, why, why would politicians voluntarily relinquish the power of referendum, or why would citizens voluntarily relinquish that power of referendum initiative and recall, and, and why would that happen given this climate of distrust? If there's enough, if, if the people are finally persuaded, as I think they will be, that however untrustworthy the politician class I is, that the, process, the complications of the process, the complications of making important policy decisions just can't be run through an initiative. I think, I have to say with all deference, that I think the initiative has created terrible mischief for people who live in Oregon. I think that the tax consequence, I mean, the fiscal consequences of your recent tax reduction are just going to continue to confound your, your uh, lives in the future. I think that this assisted suicide is just rubbing raw some wounds and in, in differences in your society. And I think, I hope that the people of Oregon at some point are going to say, we know that politicians are a bunch of bums, but at least they spend a certain amount of time on it. They have some experts around. They can't mess it up any worse than we're doing. Let's give it back to them. Um, at least that's what most of us in, in the rest of the states uh, have found. And it isn't that we make policy that much better in Illinois, but I think that there's at least the process is a little more responsible. And I guess the best proof is that we haven't tried to, to come up with a resolution of the death with dignity issue. It isn't that we don't have those same divisions that you have, but we just know that there's not a consensus on which to build. Yes. I'm Marie Polani, a City Club member. Uh, I'm not a lawyer but I am a citizen and I am a voter. Those and two are seems, much more important than being a lawyer anyway. Go ahead. It, it seems to me that in both instances, the problem is money. 
and the influence of money. It is true in our elected officials, in our campaigns, and I think it's true, it's becoming true in the initiative and referendum process because of the paid gathering of signatures. And of course, given today's situation, uh, which requires money to access the media and reach the electorate, uh, it seems to me that the main problem is really money. And again, you look at our Congress, I think they have just failed again in the campaign reform, and uh, I don't know. Uh, of course, I think we have to hope, we have to continue to hope, but what do you think? Do you think money has a lot to do in both instances? Yes. I think that the, I consider campaign finance reform the number one issue on the domestic agenda. It dismays me that uh, I was working on the issue back in the 70s, and we seem to have made, well, actually, the, the 75 Act was uh, made some progress. Is symbolic, if not real. We did clean up national elections in the early 70s uh, originally. They've, the loopholes have now overwhelmed the reform. That's true about any reform. Um, one of my favorite political philosophers was uh, Peter Finley Dunn, who was a newspaper columnist in Chicago, who wrote under the name of Mr. Dooley. And he said, the trouble with reformers, I won't even try to, 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 uh, to use his marvelous Irish Rogue, but he said the trouble with reformers is that they come out on some issue and they get all excited about it and they pass the reform and then they go back about their business. He said, whereas the sinners are out there seven days a week, all 30 days of the month and 12 months a year, and they'll outdo the reformers every day. We have to learn that reforms aren't permanent. They don't last forever. We need to go back and do something about campaign finance reform. But we have to be careful that sometimes we, in the name of reform, we end up making the problem worse rather than better. You're, and I've thought about this, and I don't, uh, don't take my word as the last word, but there is currently a move afoot that somehow you will tighten up the initiative process by seeing to it that paid um, uh, solicitors for signatures will be treated as full time and not, as, not be allowed to collect on a per signature basis. That this will, first of all, it's the right thing to do for the solicitors. I believe people ought to be treated as full-time employees with the perks of full-time employment and so on. But if, if that's considered a reform that's going to make it harder to use the initiative, it may well, but it's going to play right into the hands of moneyed interests. Because then who's going to best be able to get solicitors to go out and get the necessary number of signatures? Some group of citizens who think that somebody ought to dry up the sinkhole in their community or some uh, company that wants to change the insurance rates in Oregon. So sometimes reforms jump up and bite us, and I would hope you'd be careful. We have one such reform in Illinois I love to talk about because it still remains a hot issue in the rest of the country, the balanced budget. We have a balanced budget in Illinois. It's right in the Constitution. It says the state of Illinois cannot borrow more than $75 million, and that, or $7.5 million, and that only to build a new Capitol building. Isn't that wonderful? Let me tell you about our debt in Illinois. It is as high or higher than anybody else's in the country per capita. The difference is we pay 1% more for our money because we have to borrow it on revenue bond issues. We can't pledge the full faith and credit of the state because of that balanced budget amendment. Who have, who have we reformed? Or we have, this one pleases, tickles me even more, in the local taxing communities, we want to make sure that that the local tax districts didn't go heavily in debt. So we said that the tax districts may not borrow more than 5% of their assessed valuation because most of the money they spend is on bond issues and real estate bond issues. In Cook County, in the last time I looked, we had something like 514 separate taxing districts each one taxing 5% of the same assessed valuation. We have sanitary districts, library districts. We fragmented government, spent a fortune with all this, this duplication, and believe me, we, our taxes are not lower than yours, even though you may think they are. We even have one, my last example of reforms gone amok. One of our local taxing districts is a mosquito abatement district, but that's voted on only by by a certain area that runs south of 47th Street. 
So south of 47th Street in the city of Chicago in the suburbs, we have mosquito abatement district <coughs> and mosquito abatement programs, and they work. The problem is we've never taught the mosquitoes not to fly north of 47th Street. <coughs> You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Judge Mikva, for taking the time to uh, let us watch you exercise your flexible and creative uh, mind. Uh, were I 17, I think that uh, I would think seriously after listening to you about going to law school. Uh, uh, we, <laughs> we appreciate your being here very much today, and we do stand adjourned. Thank you.